531. Call to order. Are there any comments? There are no citizen comments. All right. Thank you, Mr. Smith. All right, that takes us to our next item, which is the superintendent update uh, for COVID-19, uh, Dr. Pearson. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, this is, of course, our first official day of summer in the school district, um, but have no fear. We still have quite a bit of activity going on um, across the district as we transition from the school year to the summer. I wanted to just mention three um, topics that are happening. Um, as we continue with our summer schedule here in D303. The first is, of course, we are continuing our meal service this summer, uh, which I have announced at previous meetings, but I just wanted to remind everyone that beginning on June 1st, we will switch to a meal service um, timeline of Mondays and Thursdays. On Monday, students will be able to pick up three days worth of meals, and on Thursdays, they'll be able to pick up two days worth of meals. Um, we will continue to offer our meal service at all of the same locations that we were uh, providing us during the school year, but we will switch to Mondays and Thursdays. Now, for the remainder of this week, because it was a short week, we continued with everyday um, meal service, and we'll make that change next Monday. I also just wanted to mention that um, summer school for high school also begins on the 1st of June. Uh, registration closed last Friday, but there are still a few seats left uh, for summer school. So if someone needs to access summer school, they need to contact their counselor and we'll see if there's a spot available in the course that they need to take. Um, we of course are doing all of our summer school uh, program um, on online or by remote learning this summer. So. Um, Anyone who needs to register next, uh, last Friday was a deadline, but you can contact your counselor if you need a seat. Um, and then finally, I just wanna mention that this is a big time for our staff members uh, to engage in professional learning. This summer, we are offering a variety of courses. Um, some of them started last week. Uh, many of them are starting in June. So far, we have 655 seats that have been taken by staff members for summer professional learning which is really great. It's a high level of engagement for our staff. Um, we, of course, are also offering summer professional learning via online um, at this time. Um, and just a couple of the topics that are big across the district, of course, we are um, rolling out elementary literacy um, in the fall. And so our elementary teachers are going to be working on their literacy um, instruction. Um, middle school science, which you approved earlier this year, um, our middle school science teachers will be engaging in some training and learning around the new science resource. Um, and then of course, there are uh, several courses on blended learning, remote learning, and online learning. And we have staff members that are taking some of those uh, classes to continue to improve and enhance their instructional practice using those resources. So we'll be able to share with you in a, few, a couple of weeks kind of a full rundown of all the classes and what people are taking, but I just wanted to highlight that for you this evening. And that concludes my update. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Pearson. All right, that leads us into our items for discussion. Um, item A, the Mid Valley Financial Report for April. Uh, yes, uh, let's see. Mid Valley is reporting that uh, revenues continue to tread ahead, ahead of the prior year due to higher tuition payments and prior year ALOP funds, and their expenditures are still trending behind the prior year. And again, that's due to the change in the IDEA flow, flow through payments, um, and they're reporting no areas of concern at this time. All right, thank you. Any questions or comments uh, pertaining to the Mid Valley Financial Report? Okay, not seeing any. All right, item B, the D303 Financial Report for April. Okay, the state continues to make regular evidence-based funding payments, and we actually have received the second categorical payment for this year. It was received on April 29th, and we anticipate the possibility of receiving a possible third categorical payment for this year, but we aren't anticipating that until maybe July or August. Expenditures are trending slightly ahead of the prior year at this time. Um, and uh, please note also that we have added the fund balance to the financial report for your information. The reconciled fund balance as of April 30th is 55,391,821. And you can note at the bottom of the memo, the dollars that are owed by the state and that has gone down due to that categorical payment that was made. And uh, currently there are no other areas of concern. 
All right, any questions or comments pertaining to uh, D303's April financial report? All right, looks good. All right, um, item C, annual assessment renewals. I believe it's probably Mr. Chizar. Yeah, thank you. Um, these are two renewals. Unify is the longitudinal data mart that allows staff to track uh, data over time. It includes all of our local assessment data as long as our um, standardized assessments go into that. And then the AMP is the uh, portion of Schoology that we have changed to last year, which is the actual local assessment delivery system, creation and delivery of tests. All right, any questions or comments pertaining to those? Um, Ms. Weibel. Well, this is more of a question for probably Dr. Pearson. Are we going to be looking to move to one specific um, assessment management platform? Because I know we kind of go back and forth between our teachers using Schoology, or I should say communication platform, um, as well as classroom. Like, are we going to look to unify that at all, um, especially with more potential e-learning on the horizon? Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately, um, Schoology is a more is a is a very robust learning management system that we purchased last year. Um, but we also know that building course content in Schoology takes a, a, quite a bit of time. Um, and so we are encouraging people to transition to Schoology. Um, but for right now, we are going to continue to support Google Classroom and Schoology both um, for, our, for our staff because we have some staff that have built entire courses in Google Classroom. Um, and so we want to be able to continue to allow them to use that tool. Um, and, and as we build new content, we're ensuring that it can be used in either platform. Um, so, so that's our hope. We are moving in it. We're, we're transitioning, but it's going to take us some time to get there. Okay. Do we have a defined um, like end date or timeline for our teaching staff by chance? Well, I think reasonably it would be by the end of next school year would be a nice time, but I, you know, in light of all of the kind of uncertainty that we have right now, I don't want to commit. We did decide to support both platforms for next school year. Um, so I would expect that there will be teachers that are using both. However, I will say that as people discover and become more comfortable with Schoology, they are making a switch um, to that platform. And I certainly know that we are going to build courses in it over the summer uh, so that there will be content already there so teachers may choose to make that change as well okay i and i appreciate that it's going to take time i mean um certainly as a parent that's been in both platforms the last 12 weeks uh i can understand that you know the intention of taking it slowly for people that have comfort in it um i certainly think for the ease of students use in the long run it would it would behoove us to be in one versus multi straddling both but I know it would take time. That's why I was curious on a timeline. I think one, one to two years is reasonable, but I'd like us to just see, put us an end date or at least talk about putting an end date on it um, for our, so our teachers have expectations of that at some point, just yes, so we have continuity for our kiddos. Yeah, and I, that would be a conversation we would wanna have with the staff. And an just make, yeah. yeah, just to make sure that, you know, kind of where they are and, and also kind of audit <laughs> what we have in what system so that we know what still needs to change. Yeah, no, I support renewing it, obviously, but I just wanted to kind of clarify that question. Thank you. I'm going to pipe in on this. Um, this is a discussion we're having at, at my district where I work as well, um, adopting a, a, some sort of an LNS. And um, Schoology is one of the ones that uh, that's being considered. Um, that is our biggest concern. Teachers, I can tell you, are probably at least as anxious to have a single system as students because when you're using multiple systems, you have work coming in from multiple places. It, it, it becomes, it, it doesn't just double, it triples to quadruples the amount of time it takes to, to find and grade work and things like that. So um, I'm sure that's something that everyone, and I know on the administrative side, it's, it's the same. Everyone wants to, to unify. They, we just need to make sure we're doing so properly. Um, I do have a question too. Um, I, Schoology has really been mostly with the high school. 
Um, are we going to be seeing it as it's being supported, as you're saying, is it going to be moving into the middle school? Again, we're going to build everything this summer in both platforms. Um, I think because the middle school was, there were several middle school teachers that were early adopters of Google Classroom when we rolled that out initially. Some of them have entire, again, entire courses built um, in, in Google. So um, we certainly are there to help people make a transition and move over. Um, but, you know, there's also some, uh, Google is, is simpler to use than Schoology is in some ways. And I think for younger students in particular, it might be uh, more manageable depending on the course. But we also know at the same time that Google continues to improve and enhance their platform. Um, you know, on a weekly basis. And so we continue to see improvements and we may find ourselves in a situation where both platforms look very similar, you know, within a, a year's time or so. So our goal is to try to have as many people move to Schoology as possible, but we also understand that people have invested quite a bit of time in building courses in Google Classroom as well. One quick question I do have, is there some uh, portability of information between Schoology and Google Classroom? Um, I know that's one of the issues, again, we're discussing elsewhere. Yeah, and so, so um, it, you can move content uh, between the two, but it's, you have to basically re rebuild your course in Schoology. So um, it's not like you can just hit transfer. <laughs> right. Everything moves over. That would be really great. Yes, it would. Um, well, and I'm talking as well about even like grade management. Um, now, are we using Schoology for grade management? I know um, right now I have to double enter. So, and I don't know precisely what happens in D303, but right now I have to double enter. Um, and we're using Microsoft, so I have to double enter in Teams and then go over and pull that information over and put it manually into PowerSchool. Is that something that can happen automatically in the meantime from? Yeah, so Mr. Shazar can probably answer this question better, but I, can, I know that it, from Schoology, it talks to um, our um, grading software, but e I, don't, I don't believe that we can do it from Google Classroom to eSchool. I think it has to be in case. Is that correct? Looking to Mr. Smith or Mr. Shazar. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually gonna defer to Matt on this one where we're at with that. That's correct, Dr. Pearson. We have uh, synchronization between Schoology and eSchool. Uh, it took a little while to get it going reliably, uh, but we feel that it is working really well now. Uh, and so it's that works for anything but the final grade, which will always be in eSchool. Uh, but for the current or as things are going through a semester, kid, uh, students and parents can, can look in Schoology for that. Okay. Um, and I'm sure you've thought of um, all of these pieces but um, as Schoology moves through or gets more prevalent, um, maybe uh, providing some sort of uh, training for kids that are it's new to and uh, parents that uh, may not uh, be as familiar. Tag along in that, we heard at CAC and I think also in um, some of the reports you have, the families and parents are asking for as much consistency um, that if you have, uh, if your child has more than one teacher using different platforms or different um, things that it becomes more difficult to work remotely. So. So to uh, Ms. Barker's question, I, I kind of, um, I'm hoping the same. Um, that everyone is going to have uh, adequate training on the, for the learning curve on this because um, I know I can use it for myself, um, but I, I'm assuming as well that students are going to need to, there's going to be a bit of a learning curve for them as well. Right. I think at first our focus for the last year before what we're doing now was on the blended learning uh, and, and making that work, especially with Schoology and the things it can do with our courses. Uh, but we've definitely heard that feedback and are working on plenty of training for teachers this summer and then also rolling out items for parents and students. Okay. All right, any other questions or comments? I'm good. Okay. Uh, is everyone okay with it going on consent? Right. I'm fine. All right. I don't see any objections. So uh, consent. 
All right. Thank you, Mr. Chizar, for that. Um, our next two items are budget. So Dr. Chapman will come in. Hopefully everyone's able to see Dr. Chapman's presentation. I know it's a little bit different than we've done in the past where we usually get to see it in person, but um, hopefully everyone got to see it and most of kind of the same, at least meat and potatoes of it. So uh, with that said, Dr. Chapman, you wanna take over? Yeah, if, if it's okay, I'll go ahead and just share my screen. And I was gonna do a very brief rundown of the key points of the presentation. Um, obviously it's a 40 plus minute presentation. We're not gonna go through that again. I, I'll assume that you all looked at it, but um, I just think covering a couple of these points would be a good a good way to do things in terms of how, uh, how the budget looks. I know it's an important topic. So um, jump in and interrupt me if we get anywhere, but this will not include any of the background information. It'll only include uh, information that is relevant to the, the actual budget itself. So, um, on the screen, you can now see, I hope, the uh, the fiscal year 2021 budget timeline. And this is very similar to the past where we do draft one uh, here at the end of May. Um, June, we don't formally talk about the budget, but of course, at any point in time, if, if we would need to revisit and specific about the budget or provide an update, we will do that. And then July, we come back to review the final budget. So it allows plenty of time for, for you to ask questions or to, to evaluate what we put together in the packet. Um, sometimes things that come up uh, in your mind a week or two later are, are certainly relevant and should be, should be discussed. And then you as a board will establish a public hearing. You have to take formal action to do that, um, which we will ask you to do on August 10th. Oh, pardon me. Um, August 12th, we'd publish the, pu the public budget hearing notice. And then September 14th, we'd hold public hearing and you as a board would look to adopt the budget. <clears throat> so this chart, um, I showed two charts back to back in the other presentation. This is just the, the, the budget for next year. And you'll see the major shift, of course, comes into taxes uh, going up to 84%. And this is just operating funds, fund 10, 20, 40, 70, education, uh, transportation, operations and maintenance. Uh, I apologize, it's on auto advance apparently from the prior model, so I'll try to keep up with it. Um, down was the state of 0.6% and down was the other local at 1.4%. Consumer price index, as we talked about, we've uh, downgraded our projections uh, from a 2%, which is, tends to be about the 10 year average, down to 1% for next year, 1.5% um, and 1.5% the following two years. Uh, and of course, we are coming off a 2.3%, which will impact uh, the 2020 levy, which is half of next year's budget. So the only unknown is half of the, the other half of the budget year. So uh, revenue assumptions, we did get news between, this always seems to happen if we put out a packet, there seems to be news that always uh, comes out from the state between. And uh, there was good news regarding um, the budget being passed at the state level that kept everything at the current funding level. Uh, the assumption embedded in that is that the, the state will be uh, seeking to fill about a $5 billion hole through borrowing uh, and or getting some kind of a, a bailout or distribution from uh, the federal government. Uh, but for now, we're, we're I guess, uh, in, in a better position than what this budget is put together, but that's okay because we'd rather give you a budget that is more conservative uh, than the other way around. So. While this budget's reflecting a drop of $500,000, we're hopeful that that now will, will be back in play. Um, we have our transportation and special education reimbursement, our categoricals. We're still gonna leave that at two because cash flow, I believe, will still continue to be a problem despite um, you know, the, the, the budget that they're being discussed right now. Uh, Medicaid revenue, CPR, PRT, you can see the reductions that we have in place there. Local funding, investment income, you know, I mentioned we probably would take this down even further, except for we've got some investments that span out into the beginning of the first quarter of next year. So that should help shelter some of the decreases in interest. Um, and then went pretty aggressive on our decrease in fee-based revenue, just because we don't really know what the start of the school year is going to look like. We don't know where national, or, I'm sorry, free and reduced lunch, uh, not lunch, but free and reduced fees will come in. Uh, people apply for those waivers. Uh, which is a new process this year, uh, how they do that. It's not tied to the free energy lunch program, but certainly that may impact our revenue there. Um, and on the federal side, certainly an increase through CARES Act funding, and potentially we might see additional funding that's being discussed on the federal level, which should help. 
And on the expenditure side, uh, this chart just shows the cost shift in uh, expenditures, of course, the largest being salaries and benefits, which uh, continues to go up at a larger level, mostly because capital outlay was cut uh, more than in half uh, based on some of the budget reductions that we made. Oh, excuse me. Um, expenditure assumptions, uh, we, we are part of, uh, have our, our bargaining groups, uh, we're currently in our first year and, and next year will be year two of our bargaining agreements. So most of those are known costs. Um, for non-bargaining staff, um, the salary costs, the total costs uh, were held constant from uh, this current year. Um, health insurance projections, um, we actually were starting at about a 6% about a month or two ago and we've uh, dropped that down to about a 5%. We uh, have been trending really well. And then we still have a phase in of a half percent TRS obligation should the state decide to um, shift that over to school districts, which has been discussed for years and years and years and still hasn't happened. Uh, but of course, it, it may happen in the future. Um, <clears throat> won't talk too much about this because you're well aware of some of the elementary school day uh, staffing plans and, and has been discussed quite a bit at both this and the learning and teaching committee. But certainly the revision from the original plan with the savings of around $735,000. Um, additionally, we've uh, held on hiring for some non-teaching vacant positions that have come open. Um, we're waiting to see when we'll be back uh, in the classroom before filling some of those positions. And in the summertime, we generally hire in some seasonal costs, uh, seasonal staff, excuse me, and we've uh, decided to, uh, to, to lower the amount of costs that we have there, but also not to extend those into July, which is the start of the fiscal year. And we've also worked to move ahead with our general, uh, our GSF uh, custodial cleaning contract so that we can cut that contract for the month of July as well. Uh, reductions came from a lot of different places and, and thankfully not many that are, are closely tied to instruction, which is great. Certainly we project less travel, professional development, so we're able to make reductions there. Um, technology, you know, Mr. Smith has, and his team have done a great job of bringing things um, up to a higher level and, and fulfilling some of the needs that we've had over the years. Uh, so we can scale back a little bit for a year uh, and, and not really cause a whole lot of impact there. And then on the Fund 20 side, Mr. Baird and his team with capital improvements, again, because we've kept up with a lot of these things, uh, to take a year and, and, and scale back isn't going to really uh, put us in a big hole uh, for future years. So this budget, while it's conservative from that perspective, also doesn't um, take us and put us in a bad position where we're trying to catch up for five to 10 years after. Um, buses, similarly, you as a board have, have made great decisions in terms of uh, allocating additional funds as they've been available in prior budget years to uh, get ahead of our fleet purchasing. So uh, we were behind substantially five years ago, and now we've caught up and uh, if we don't need to buy any buses this year, we can we can do that and not feel like we're going to be in a bad spot. Um, and then in Fund 60, we've taken down our additional capital projects um, that we were counting on. So we're okay there. Uh, the, the net total is in, in operating funds, which again is the, the key for the operating funds. Is this is where your financial profile score gets tied to. So um, what happens in the total budget? Well, it certainly matters in terms of dollars and fund balance. Uh, that does not impact your financial profile score. So as long as we finish the year in a positive position, um, then we get credit for that in the, in the score and have an, have an opportunity to maintain that perfect 4.0 rating. So this budget does that. In terms of all funds, um, that deficit of 831,084 uh, looks a lot better with, with the state budget that was just passed. So we're, we can add back a half a million dollars plus um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if we come back to you with a final budget that shows you a balance, balance budget for the entire, uh, all funds as well. Um, so we're certainly in a position to do that. Um, even if we do not, um, it's worth noting that the fiscal year 20 is expected to end in a surplus and those funds likely will uh, cover any kind of a deficit that's budgeted for. But regardless, we always monitor that budget during the year and our goal is to always come in uh, with actual spending uh, below what we anticipate um, our revenues to be. Uh, and this chart uh, about a month ago was giving me a lot of panic and, and certainly now I feel a lot better about it. The long-term view is still very fuzzy, but if you look out the next couple years, we're still maintaining that flat um, 
perspective in both the, the red, which is our high point and our purple and the low point. And uh, as, as Ms. Mader talked about earlier, we uh, at our low point, right, was, was you know, at the end of April, we're kind of right around that $55 million mark, uh, which puts us kind of in the balance range of 28 to 34%, actually potentially even slightly below it. So sometimes we focus a lot of times on that high point, but um, you as a board have, have uh, managed that well in terms of where our fund balance sits now. Uh, we have a, a great um, situation in terms of how our budget can support our programs and instruction for next year, and also uh, puts us in a position that we can make adjustments in the future if we need to. So uh, obviously monitoring state funding uh, will still be important, even though we, we just heard some good news there. We'll still want to continue to see that fallout and where that comes into play, and certainly if additional federal funds become available as well, um, our plan will be to come back at the July business services meeting and review draft two, and then again, those dates I mentioned before uh, in terms of when we look for public hearings and then adoption at the September 14th meeting. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and open it up to any questions you might have. I'll, I'll jump in first here. Uh, thank you very much for the, the presentation, uh, Dr. Chapman. Uh, as always, very uh, thorough and informative. Uh, in terms of transportation for next year, do we have, uh, I, I guess I have two questions. Has there been any discussion as, you know, if we are required to uh, limit the number of students on buses um, with how that would affect the budget? And also, do we have the, uh, the 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 actual buses to to support uh, any directives from the state where where we have uh, a limited number of students. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I will I will I will first just say if if we're attempting to try to stick to our current schedule and all grade levels um, would ex would need transportation. Um, I think it's pretty clear we don't have the ability to do that with our current fleet at, at the CDC recommendation of 10 students per bus, which I, I've heard. I've, I've heard somebody say eight, I've heard some people say 12, but I've, I've, I've seen 10. Um, that number would be too low to, to do every level with the buses we have in hand. I will say we, for, we did forego trading in 10 of our buses uh, that were scheduled to be traded in as part of the purchase in June, just so we'd have extra fleet on hand for another year. So. Um, those buses will help us to do whatever we need to do. Uh, we are certainly hopeful that we'll get some guidance next week from the state in terms of uh, where they see things going from a transportation perspective. But your question is a good one. It's it's really the probably of all of the unknowns for the next the start of the school year. Transportation is is probably the most uh, cloudy of them all. Um, uh, so there there are certainly options that are available. Excuse me, Mr. McNally. There are certainly options that are available, but um, you know, at this point in time, we're, we're going to be working on some of those plans. I just want to jump in because that was the one question really that kind of has been sticking in my in the back of my head as well is, is transportation. Assuming we're going to have a non-traditional schedule should we start the school year in person. Um, I'm going to assume that that's going to help with some of the staggering of the bus schedules. Um, but do you think just as a ballpark do you think we would be close with that kind of the staggered schedule where we you know we're not gonna we're not gonna have all those kids at eight in the morning you know, staggered school schedule um essentially kind of cutting that pretty much in half right um do you think we'd be close we we have not run through the various scenarios yet i know i've, I've asked um uh, Ms. Primdahl to kind of start thinking about that, but we were kind of holding off to see what would come out of that June 1st guidance because there's some things that the state could change in terms of the requirement and the, you know, the distance from school. Maybe they they relax that standard. Um, you know, maybe they provide us an option uh, where there's, there's waving out of transportation, things of that nature. So we haven't dug too deep into that yet, yet Mr. McNally, to be honest with you. I think those are the things that we want to dig into and we plan to do in early June to start really looking at, at where, where does that stand, but um, certainly it's something that we have to get, get, get down as, as the summer goes through. 
Uh, Dr. Chapman, I had a question for you related to, you talked about the district level reductions around professional development. Can you speak to that a little further in terms of where, where did that happen or what does that consist of? Is that the teacher level or what does that look like? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, mostly, no, not so much at the teacher level there. I think it, we, we again tried to stay at it. I will speak to, let me, let me clarify. At the school budget level, we did not make any adjustments. At the district level, so with Ms. Geyer and, and Ms. Jensen, and you know, there, there are some, some areas where you know, we, we took a look at some very minor reductions, but nothing, nothing very significant um, in, in those areas. Um, it was kind of like, let's look at the last five year history and see where we've been coming in at. And is there an opportunity to take out five to 10% in various line items? If so, kind of tighten those budgets up, then, then we did that. So there, it wasn't wholesale reductions. There wasn't, we didn't spend a lot of time looking at, you know, what did we really forecast that PD to be for next year and making large reductions at this time? Because thankfully we didn't need to do that yet. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, any other questions or comments? for Dr. Chairman pertaining to the D303 budget. All right, seeing any? Um, so as Dr. Chapman mentioned, this is our first draft and uh, we look forward to the next one. All right, um, item E, first draft of the Mid-Valley Special Ed Cooperative Budget. Yeah, I'm gonna make this one really quick and um, Ms. Spore, I believe, has joined us as well. So if there are questions that she could address those or Ms. Palacy, one or the other. Um, you have the whole presentation in your packet. I just want to highlight a couple things. Uh, first, um, just very much appreciate their work as um, they won their budget and they realized that um, not, unlike, not unlike us, you know, we're, we're all kind of expected to, to tighten up a little bit here with the budget. And, and what you see in your packet is um, a very modest 0.3% increase to the prior year budget, uh, which is great. Um, they, they've made adjust, adjust, adjustments, excuse me, similar to what we've done with supplies and purchase services, uh, which has been very helpful. Um, I did want to make sure that you're aware that unlike districts, um, Mid Valley does not receive any CARES Act funds. Um, so those additional funds that flow through, flow through title money um, does not help to supplement their budget. So. Um, Ms. Four kind of went through and, and looked at her budget. She did, they do a zero based budget. So they kind of start from scratch. They plan out their programs and services and uh, attach their staffing to that model. And they're largely, um, you know, staff reliant, of course, even more so than we are being the special ed cooperative. So um, I'm not gonna ramble on any further. Um, the packet is, is, has, you know, more detail in it. I'll just open it up to any questions that you might have. All right, any other questions or comments? All right, well, like the D301, this is just the first draft and we will see another one this summer. All right, thank you, Dr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, next item, item F, all day kindergarten cost review. Yes, um, I can head that up. Let me grab my notes. Piles of papers to go through here. Um, all day kindergarten is um, a program that um, in the past, we've always tried to look to balance that budget. And what I wanted to do in the, in the packet on page 70 is just summarize both the financial perspective on the revenue expense side, as well as kind of some of the class size maximums that have changed throughout the time. I also wanted to show kind of what our half day enrollment versus our full day enrollment is. So you should have all that information there and, and can see that for yourself. I won't go through it all, but what I will say is, you know, you can see we kind of have placed ourselves right around that 84% in terms of where we're at with all day kindergarten. Uh, there was a little bit of a, a, a downtrend uh, last year, but before that, a couple years in a row at that level. And up until uh, this current budget, the FY 2021, we projected breaking even. Uh, next year is the first year that all, all day kindergarten would not self support. And that's due to increases in salary, but also lowering of class sizes. Um, those projections are difficult because uh, one thing that we cannot predict necessarily is 
how many of those students are going to qualify for free and reduced um, waivers and, and those costs and where those come in. Uh, so that's always uh, something that we try to monitor. But um, I just wanted to give you that information and you know, Ms. Geyer and I kind of talked through this and, and, and what kind of information that might help you in your discussion and kind of just open it up to some questions for you on that. So we have a question. Um, do the expenses also incorporate those half-day teachers that we would have anyway? That's a great question. No, the uh, the way we do this from a budget perspective is um, any any of the the staff that is um, additional costs. So we do like a 50-50 split. So once the teachers are identified, who's going to be an all-day kindergarten teacher, we take their salaries and benefits, and we we code them at a 0.5 FTE. Uh, half of that goes to the building uh, directly that they're gonna be serving at. And then the other half goes into a district account into our all day kindergarten program. So um, we're truly allocating the costs that are connected to um, them serving in that capacity as an all day kindergarten teacher. Um, and then also, as I'm looking at, um, do we know, roughly about maybe for the last two or three years, roughly about how many students, um, if given, I guess, how many students could be in those uh, all day kindergarten classes if we just had all day? Um, for example, it wouldn't necessarily be, we would need a teacher for a hundred, you know, and two students, they would filter into other classes that we already have teachers? I can answer that, um, Dr. Chapman. Thank we you. have not done that. We have not looked at that. Um, it's something that we could, but we just have not um, considered that because it would be where the children are located. We'd have to go through and take into account where they, um, their home school and that. So we have not done that in the past um, to look at that. Can I just ask a quick, we still are required by the state to offer half day, correct? That's correct. Mrs. Geyer, do we, um, if we're required to offer half day, do we have to offer it at every facility? No, and we don't at this time offer half day at every facility. We have- right. Um, two centers across the district and um, both Anderson and Davis over the last three years have had their own half day because of the numbers there. It's been cheaper to have them have a full classroom there than to um, transfer the students. Right, I know we have some that don't, but I know that it is offered at more than um, potentially would be if we went to an all day. Yeah, so we have two sites, one on the east, um, one in the center of town, and then um, Davis and Anderson both have a 0. 0.5. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, so looking, I mean, looking at this, obviously the majority of students are choosing full day. Um, and we've heard that um, a number of our surrounding districts are providing full day without cost. Um, what um, did you, take a look at a comparable districts that might be providing all day kindergarten? I, I can answer. We, we've had this discussion at our, um, our unit group meetings in the past. Um, uh, of our co comparable districts, uh, unit districts in the area, the, uh, the other two that I know of, and I don't even know if this has changed, this is from a couple years ago, so somebody can jump in and tell me wrong. I know uh, Wheaton 200 charges for all day kindergarten and they charge right around $4,000. Um, I live in that district. Um, and Barrington was charging at around $3,500. Um, I don't know if they continue to, but those are the two. Otherwise, um, I believe our other surrounding districts uh, do have, have included um, all day kindergarten at no cost. And I won't speak to the reasons for that. Maybe Ms. Geyer would, would know better in terms of the reasons, but I'm, I'm, I would imagine um, probably you know, the participation level plays into that at some degree. And I'm not sure that if that's accurate. I, I'd throw that out there. Is 
I don't know if she's an answer. Um, uh, I, um, I'm sorry, I, I don't have any other information um, regarding the other um, districts. I think that we um, continue to look at our half day and full day enrollment of staying um, in the 88, around the 80% and 20%. We have, you know, I'm sure there's some families it's because of costs, but with um, the support that we do for um, students that are families that are on free and reduced lunch, I think that helps. Um, we look at their test scores and see um, if they need additional support, as well as there are some families who just are, um, want their children to only go to school for half the day at that kindergarten level. Right, I do think there's a, probably a small amount that would select half day regardless. Um, although I think there's that group of people that are kind of that in between um, as far as they don't qualify for free and reduced, but yet it, it's such a budget impact that um, they cannot take advantage of it. Um, so that's the group I'm you know, concerned about, I'm concerned about equity um, and I'm concerned about um, providing our students with something that our surrounding, just the surrounding towns in the Fox Valley provide. Um, I'm thinking if a young couple's come, going to move in and they're looking in you know, one town versus St. Charles and St. Charles doesn't provide all day kindergarten and they have you know, two or three upcoming kindergartners and that's, that goes to a property value. So I, I think that that's something that the board needs to consider. I don't know if you know, whether people are thinking, but um, maybe this is a time where we talk about it and talk about when we want to bring it back again. Um, I'm just wanting to hear others' thoughts on this. I think historically, the board has not wanted to do that. That was a different board. Um, I know that um, there have been lots of conversations about um, reducing the cost and also having a zero amount for families who would qualify. And I believe the history of the board was that they wanted people to have to pay something. Um, I'm, I'm, I am an all day kindergarten um, supporter and would love for us to be able to look at supporting that. I don't see how we can do that for next year by any means. So. I think it might be something that if we are doing long range planning to consider, I know that um, families have asked for that, especially when their kids are in kindergarten. Um, I was gonna jump in and ask Dr. Have, Pearson. Um, Dr. Pearson, I mean, is this something that uh, you and your team wanna look at a timeline of strategy and where it would fit potentially? I mean, I think it's something, you know, it, just for discussion, for the board um, or, you know, realistic timeline to yeah. Mrs. McCabe's point financially, you know, we're not in a position this year uh, or, you know, for you to bring it back. I'm not sure it, what committee to talk about is, as a topic of, is this what you want to do? Yeah, I certainly, um, we're open to having the conversation and engaging in the planning process for that. I think you're right. Next year's budget year is not the year to make this big jump. Um, we've already made some other commitments that were other that were priorities before this topic came up. Um, I think the other thing is, um, you know, it will have space implications as well at our elementary schools, um, and you know that could coincide with our facility, um, you know, master planning that we're doing as well, and looking at some of our, our elementary schools in space. Um, because we will probably increase some sections if we have um, all day available um, at no cost uh, to members of the community. So I think we would want to gather some information from families. We would want to look at our facility space. We would want to, of course, look at the budget. And I think if the board really wants us to make that kind of change for a school year, we would want to start that conversation early in the fall. So by the time we do our kindergarten registration in the winter months, that we are able to let families know so that we can plan appropriately for the coming school year. Okay, and I think it would roll into our facility utilization <laughs> facility utilization plan discussion that will naturally start occurring next year as well, um, and that might that might marry well. I think um, it would 
I have a question. Um, it's probably to Dr. Chapman. I want to make sure I'm reading it right. Is is our projected enrollment for the next school year a total of 634 students? Am I reading that right? That was the most recent information we had, and Ms. Geyer can probably tell you. Yeah, so that is what currently we have enrolled. Um, we, if our, if we look at enrolled for next year. If we look at what our predictions are, we are probably still have about 120 to 150 students who have not have not enrolled. We don't know if that'll stay up that high with what's currently going on, but we, we do have um, additional students that should be still enrolling this spring and summer. So just to repeat back, so historically in your experience, or we have about another 20% that are late enrollers. Is the enrollees, is that what you're thinking, Mrs. Geyer? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would still be a reduction in enrollment for kindergarten over the prior year. So I'm wondering how does that compare with our um, enrollment projections? Is that on target with what we've thought up to this point or is it less or more? And I don't know who to ask that to. So are you saying is the 630 some um, normal to where we're at right now? No, so it, we've had enrollment projections for each of the school years that, that we've talked about and we've tracked that all the way to um, 12th grade. So I'm wondering how does this compare to that projection for kindergarten for 20, 2020, 2021? So we are projected for about 800 students. Okay. So we're about 100 and either somewhere between 120 and 150 students short right now. And that I think if I understood the question correctly, that, that is that in line with the with the enrollment projections we've had over the years for this year? Correct. Um, Dr. Shazar, if you have anything to add to that, but yes, it's pretty much in line. That I, I kind of recall us being in that eight to eight fifty range in projections. So, yes. Yeah, we've we've leveled out, and we're we're looking at about eight hundred students coming in at kindergarten, roughly there. It goes up or down a little bit depending on birth rate, but um, we are also entering in times that are different. Um, there's been more mobility, there's been other concerns going on. Um, so we'll, we'll run into some variation that we're not sure of. Dr. Coffrin, who uh, works with these, is also trying to figure some things out and trying to find some comparison times. But as of right now, the numbers we have at this point in time and looking how we go are trending towards that 800 again. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I had a, a, a question and comment on the, the half day. Um, the one thing, you know, we talk about the, uh, when people look at the community and, and I agree, people look at what are, what are the things gonna be that, what's gonna cost me as I move into that community. Um, the one thing we've kind of always talked about is having a lower, uh, a lower tax rate than the other districts in Kane County. And that's something else. And so I guess my question would be, if we went to an all day kindergarten, fully funded all day kindergarten, um, how might that, or would that impact our tax rate? And that's my first question. I, I don't know that it would, but. Well, yeah, so it's a good question. I mean, there's not a direct relationship to tax rate, um, but if, if we were basically needing to absorb $1.2 million into the budget, um, you, you as a board at some point in time, I guess I would, let's look back to, to where we were, you know, seven years ago, roughly. And, and, and the board was doing abatements of taxes right. and was, was taking that out of, out of fund balance, essentially. Um, that probably wouldn't have been able to occur. So right. that, that, that's kind of, that's the correlation. I, I think you can make to, to, to the tax rates and your point's a very good one, Mr. McNally. Um, but, but is there a direct relationship? No. Um, I think operationally it may cause if you continue, if you were to, and I don't think this board would deficit spend, then you may at some point say, oh boy, we need to go out to, to, to referendum. Uh, we may need to issue debt in order to, uh, to balance our budget because the costs are too high. So that's where it could come into play. 
Um, some of our surrounding districts, most of our surrounding districts have a significant more debt than we do. And I think that's, that's certainly a part of it, where you spend your funds. Yeah, that's, that was kind of where I was going with that is that, you know, that's, it's, as, I, as Dr. Sloman used to say, when you, you, know, you push on one part of the balloon, the air has to go somewhere else. So the other question I have um, is something that I've been asked by a number of people in the community. And that is if we went to fully funded all day kindergarten would half day still be available in the schools where it is. So we're required to offer half day if we offer full day. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I think it, it may be a good idea to early in the year, as uh, Dr. Pearson said, to bring it back to LNT to determine if the board values all day kindergarten um, and as a an educational uh, piece rather than um, budgetary. And if that's something that they do value, then moving forward with looking at how can we make that happen? Is it possible? Um, you know, and what, what parts of the balloon the air is moving around in to use ads. Um, but I, think, I stole it, but. <laughs> but I think it's important to find out, is this something we value? Um, what are the potential components um, to all day kindergarten? What's the benefit? Um, and so I think that that's where we have to, I think that's where we have to start. And to tag along, I liked your comment about equity. Um, also, if in that, um, when you look through, I know the district has done work to provide um, for students who cannot, who cannot afford through title funds. So if that could be included to show what we have done as a district to um, be sure students who would benefit from the all day program, but can't um, pay for it. So including the equity issue, I think is critical. I would just, from me, I have one final comment. I definitely, um, like you, Mrs. McCabe, I'm an all-day kindergarten, and Mrs. Barker, too, I think, um, an all-day kindergarten supporter. Uh, my only hesitation is just we need to make sure that we're able to make it work from a budgetary standpoint and timing. So just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I agree with what Ms. Barker is saying. I think it, you, you do have to decide as a as you know where, what you want to do from an instructional perspective, but to also keep in mind, um, we generally bring to you our fees in January. Um, so I think regardless of whether you want to do all day kindergarten or not, one question I think that would be worthy of consideration before we get to that point is, do you want to balance? Do we want the all day kindergarten program to be self sufficient? Uh, because where we're heading towards now is a slight subsidy on that program. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be an absolute either. There, there's, there's numerous different points along that spectrum that you could decide to, 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 to lean into and say, we're, well, we still wanna have some kind of a fee-based system. And I know back in the past, uh, the, the prior board didn't really want to, to you know, subsidize it quite so much. Um, maybe you as a board are, are more willing to do that. So I think there's lots of options to look at. Another another thought uh, before we go, and I don't want to belabor this too much more, but um, would it be possible? I know we we kind of look at a lot of this stuff based on the free and reduced. You know who's gonna who's gonna pay and who's who's gonna be subsidized. Um, is it possible to have a different kind of a structure for how we view this for uh, fees or partial fees? And, and I haven't even fully thought that out, so. If it sounds incoherent, perhaps it is. The answer to the question is yes, it's possible to have a different kind of structure based on what priorities the board puts in place and how much revenue you wanna to try to raise, um, you know, from zero dollars to, you know, trying to make it uh, balanced. So uh, I think we should talk about all those pieces and I, I, we are certainly happy to bring it back in the fall. I did want to know Mr. Moore, Mr. Moore provided an update. Uh, um, Batavia is also it was just half day. Uh, There's one district I didn't mention. Uh, he did confirm. So Elmhurst uh, 205 just phased in and passed a referendum in 2018. Um, so they're moving to a, a, a more of an all day format, but 
uh, Batavia was the other one that I had forgotten about. So thank you, Mr. Moore. All right, thank you, Dr. Chairman, for uh, providing the board with a look at numbers um, to at least kind of get this discussion started. And uh, as Mrs. Parker said, um, I think LMT is a great place to bring this back uh, to get a pulse of the board from an instructional side of things and see where we are. And then that can then, um, if it moves forward, go to a future business service meeting as well for financials. Um, all right, item G, the RFP for actuarial services. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and just jump in on this and then uh, Ms. Sedwick might have uh, something to add or she can certainly answer questions. This is one of the rare times that we're probably gonna bring to you and, and make a recommendation not to take the lowest number. Uh, we are currently with Lauterbach and Amon and have been with them for a long, long time, providing um, our uh, actuarial services for what's called OPEB obligation, other uh, post-employment benefits. Um, so essentially, it's it's a it's an actuarial calculation that feeds into our audit every year. Uh, we don't aren't required to do it um, completely every year. It's every other year. So the every the other year is a uh, rollover, what they call it. Um, our current firm, while they are the cheapest, um, the service hasn't been very good. Um, they've been late, and that's caused us a little bit of stress as we try to put our audit together. So um, we did do reference checks on the next lowest MWM consulting group. They're currently at West Aurora, and they're very pleased with them. Um, certainly, if you want to continue to keep the lowest one, we're okay with it. We'll deal with it. Um, but we thought it might be a good idea to take a shot on them this year and uh, and see if MWM can come through and, and do better for us. Uh, I would add that that was not their original price. We did go back and ask without showing the result. We asked them if that was the best they could do and they did drop their price. And make note that it is for a two year contract. Correct. Any uh, questions or comments from the board? pertaining to this item. You can see any? Okay, um, consent. Thank you, Dr. Chairman. All right, item H, Thank you. review copy paper bids for 2021. Yeah, I, I think I'll just let Ms. Sedwick talk about this one, if that's all right. Okay, we do our copy paper bid every year because we want to try to get the lowest price uh, for the best quality paper. And once again, this year we sent out specifications to 11 vendors. We had five responses, which was really good. Um, sometimes we only get two or three. Um, and we found a new paper vendor called Liberty Paper. Um, they met our standards and they gave us the lowest cost. Um, they are out of California, but they ensure delivery uh, on our timeline. Um, the cost is slightly higher than last year, but that is because some of the schools ordered um, additional paper that they did not order last year. So we are recommending that we go with Liberty Paper for this year's um, copy paper. Are there any questions? No, I'm not seeing any. And then, yeah, as um, Sedwick mentioned, uh, we do this every year uh, to look at for savings. And it's, um, again, kind of came in under the state contract as well. Right. It always seems to come in lower, so. Yeah, and I just want to thank Ms. Sedwick because she, this actually takes quite a bit of work to put this together. And every year we continue to see savings over the state contract. So it's definitely worth the time to do it. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we can put that in for consent then. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Next item, uh, item I, setting the amount for the treasurer's surety bond, Dr. Chapman. Yeah, this is a kind of routine business that we're required to do uh, for state statute. Um, it's a treasurer's bond that needs to be 
uh, roughly 25% of all the bonds, uh, the monies of the districts has custody in for the year. Um, we've raised that in prior years to up to $40 million. I think next year we'll probably be in a position to, to lower that dollar amount. But in terms of what it costs us, we were paying 26,400 last year. It's 27,583 this year. So not a huge increase on that fee. Um, we do that through um, an underwriter, through broker's risk. Um, that's in your packet. Any questions or comments pertaining to the surety bond? As Dr. Chad mentioned, it's kind of a something we just have to do every year. So, all right, uh, we'll put that on for consent then. All right, moving along, item J, um, software and support renewals. Mr. Smith? So we have several renewals here for you that uh, the board has seen several times over the years. We bring them to you yearly in the summer. If you have any questions on a specific one, I'm happy to answer. All right, any questions or comments, Mr. Smith, pertaining to the renewals that are in the packet? This is why. I will do my annual plea to please allow one parent email into the system for our student accounts. Um, in re in regards to uh, their Gmail accounts, I don't know what a renewal falls under, but I usually do it in your renewals, um, especially with, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, I don't, so can you clarify for me? Sure. So for the past three years, I've asked the district um, to please allow the student accounts um, to communicate with one parent account outside of the D303 um, uh, email. So currently students can only communicate within the D303 network. So when you're speaking to teachers, um, they can't communicate with, they can't carbon their parent outside. So it's up to the student to show it to the parent. Um, and if you're in a line of communication that's ongoing, um, the student can't be involved if the parent and the teacher are talking or if the student and the teacher are talking, the parent can't be involved. So for the last three years, I've had a plea to IT and to our administration to figure out a um, somewhat easy process, especially in this last 10, 12 weeks of e-learning to allow one um, approved signer from each family to be allowed to communicate somehow. I don't know how that would happen you the IT gurus, um, but that is what I would request as a, um, from I've heard from the community as well as a parent myself. So I was gonna, annual plea. Uh, I would like, if that's the case, I would like it to be two parents then. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just thinking at least one representative from a household, but yeah. Right, I'm really I'm have to be a certified parent of the child or yeah. guardian. Yeah. Oh, parent or certified parent or guardian of the child. So right. just a certified parent or guardian of the child. And you can do two, whatever makes it the easiest for the district to start. So I see Matt continuing to smile. So go ahead and tell us how difficult that would be. Well, it really is an all or nothing setting. We would have no way to manage uh, the thousands of different uh, email addresses that are out there that would have to tie them to our individual students. Uh, and the fact that parents or outside email addresses can't communicate with students has been a policy in the district for much longer than I've been here. Uh, over the last few years, uh, we've loosened that a little bit for students at the high school level and special programs, uh, in, uh, incubator, and some of the other programs similar to that. We are allowing them some limited outside access, and I believe we've looked at starting to open that up for juniors and seniors. So I think it's something that'll take some time, uh, but eventually we'll see that loosening up. Okay, great. And I would encourage you to, to look at other districts and see what they do uh, in regards to that. I, there's got to be a way that we can at least loosen it up a bit. That's all. Without, without letting them get spam, we don't want them to get junk mail. So, The other issue is, is they can't print from their Chromebooks, which means that it becomes extraordinarily difficult to really operate on a virtual setting or just even at home when you're trying to print something to help them edit or anything like that. Um, so those are those are two things that um, are tricky when they can't print and then they can't email their parents to print for them. 
Um, so. you, actually, you actually can print from the Chromebook? Um, you can, but if, a, if a student, if it's, it's owned by the teacher and they're not allowing that, you, you just, then you can't, it can't be sent. So there's some things that can be, but some things that can't be. Um, and some, and two of my kids' Chromebooks they can print from, and one can't, one can't, or opposite. Two that can't, one that can. I don't know why. Yeah, um, those are individual issues that we could look at. Uh, and a lot of these concerns that we're hearing right here are things that we could solve easily with uh, more in a, buy into the LMS platform. Uh, it makes it much easier to communicate with parents and students all together. So this might become an obsolete problem. Well, the communication between the parents and the teacher, that still remains. Right, it, it sounds like it's gonna be an easier thing once we get an LMS. So I, I don't mean that the, the issue is obsolete, but the, the problematic nature of it may be obsolete in that uh, you, adopting an LMS may solve a lot of that communication problem. It sounds I think, like. I think we'll see a lot less frustration from every party on communication after some of the summer learning that our friends in the learning teaching department have planned. Okay. All right. Um, if there's no other further questions or comments pertaining to the software rules. Looking around. All right. Then we'll put those on for consent um, at the board meeting. All right. Um, item K, review of bids, award of contract for the Belgram Elementary School Playground Improvements. Yeah, the, the school district has a uh, joint agreement, uh, intergovernment agreement, excuse me, with uh, the St. Charles Park District uh, for playground replacements. And Belgram was identified as one such that was ready for replacement. And in your packet are the results of that bid opening. And D and J Landscape out of Plainfield was the low bidder at 168,101.73, uh, which was under the budget of 175,000. So that would be the recommendation uh, for your approval. Any questions or comments pertaining to Bill Graham's? Quick, quick question Is there any sort of cost shift, uh, cost, cost split with that between us and the, the park district? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the, the IGA is it's a cost share, uh, 50, 50 with the park district. So our, our cost then would be the one sixty eight. It would be half of that. Half that. Okay. Well, yes. what, is that correct? Am I right? Not, I, Mr. It's Man, my understanding that it's only the ones that are inside the park district. Oh, that's oh, yeah. So I don't believe Belgram is inside the park district. Oh, so they just bid it out for us. I'm sorry. Correct. They bid it out and do our specs and maintenance for us, but we, we do the whole cost if it's outside of the park district, but we share the cost inside the park district. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That makes more sense. Thank you for clarifying. All right. No other questions or comments. Then we'll put down for consent for the board meeting. Um, item L. Charles H. Haynes Center, concrete curb and sidewalk repair. Yes, so this is uh, directly out in front of the Haynes building um, on the corner of Oak and, what is it, 10th or 9th? 9th? 9th. 9th. Oak and 9th. Uh, that sidewalk that runs along uh, the fence line where the two story wing was demolished has uh, deteriorated significantly. It's not safe. Mm -hmm. um, there's areas of, of, uh, of deterioration that are, are really beyond repair. So there's a, a long stretch of probably 60 to 80 feet that needs to be replaced there. And then you may recall if you've driven by that anytime recently that the four or five spots closest to Oak Street, parking spots on the street um, tend to flood and really are not able to be parked in. Um, so part of, part of this would also to be, be to replace those spots and uh, make the curbing slant in such a way that it drains to the street properly. Any questions or comments pertaining to item L? Nope. Oh. All right. All right. Consent. All right. Uh, item M, Charles H. Haynes Centerfield um, restoration. Yeah, so this is the area uh, where the mobiles used to be. Um, you may recall that when those were removed, we did um, blanket and seed 
um, the rear two thirds area of that area and it's come in nicely. Our grounds team did a fantastic job of that. Uh, we still had um, contractors parking and using some of the spot up front, which is about to be vacated. So this is to finish that job, to, to make that all grass again in that area, as well as to remove uh, and abandon a portion of sidewalk that's no longer needed and, and plant uh, grass over that as well. So um, that cost is included in your packet. Um, the nice thing is when we get rid of that, that asphalt area, it's, it's less maintenance and, and certainly less cost in the long run as well. Any questions? Nope. Don't see any. All right. Put that in for consent as well. All right. Uh, Radley Middle School PE locker placements. Yeah, this is in your packet as just information. Uh, the bid um, date, the, the bid um, receipt is, is going to be a bid opening, excuse me, is going to be on June 2nd. Um, timing wise, we just couldn't get it in before the committee meeting. So apologize for that. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that you were aware of the project itself and could answer any questions so that when we bring this to the board meeting, um, you're not surprised at kind of what we're talking about from a project perspective. Um, in the packet is a, is a kind of a diagram that shows the issues with those lockers, uh, the, the safety concern with the height of those lockers, uh, which should be resolved by this project. When were the original lockers put in, Dr. Chapman? I do not know, but I presume it was when that was built. I think they're original. Oh, original building. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's Mark. I'm pretty sure they're original to the building, which would have been 1995 or 2000. Okay. Not seeing other questions or comments. Um, we'll put that on for action then since it's gonna be, um, you know, it'll be the first time we see the, that cost. So we'll put that in for action. It'd be great. All right, um, that takes us to item O, which is the facility master plan update. Yeah, we have uh, with us on the call, uh, if he's hung in there, uh, Mr. Dan Critta, <laughs> and uh, in your packet is kind of a couple of, of slides that he's just gonna talk you through. We're not gonna go through a formal presentation, but. Uh, Mr. Critt and his team have done a tremendous job of working with our principals uh, going through our schools and uh, I'll let him talk about that process as well as what is ahead. So Dan, please. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Chapman. Uh, great to see everyone tonight. Uh, hope you're all staying safe. Uh, we appreciate the boards uh, making the opportunity and the administration to give us a, a real-time update to this process. I think you've been hearing some narratives here and there over the last few months, but uh, we're glad to do this live and I'm available for any questions you might have. Um, I, we, in advance of the meeting, we did uh, send out some graphics that kind of depicted the progress of our efforts. It's really a three prong approach. Um, currently what we're doing is we're wrapping up that fact finding stage of the process to get that baseline or common base of knowledge that will be really the stepping stone for a community engagement or a task force process that's targeted for the fall. So right now, um, representing the building conditions for each of the buildings is a facility assessment. And that's the, done through observations and some dialogue with the school folks. Um, we do have a layer that will review that in June. Um, we're targeting all these reports just uh, by the way to have a draft version um, towards the end of June. So we can sit down with the operations and walk through what we found. Um, one thing that's been missing from some of our walkthroughs just based on the situation is we haven't had that side-by-side -side, um, walkthrough to hear some of the things that maybe aren't always visible. Um, we're also looking at the buildings from an educational alignment standpoint, and the methodology we've used for that is starting out with touring with the principals, looking at every building, walking the buildings with them. That all happened back in February. Um, and then our follow-up was intended to be a live uh, uh, BLT meeting with their built team, um, but uh, we chose to do that via video conference and I thought it was really successful. Um, they chimed in on, on what kind of findings that we saw as well as the principal's input and kind of filtered that and prioritized those things. So we have a list of needs for every building. Um, the two high schools are the two buildings that uh, we have still have to have that exercise done. Uh, they're just a little busier than the rest of the buildings the last few weeks. Um, 
beyond that, uh, we also look at capacity. That's kind of the third prong of this is what's the potential capacity of each building based on how the schools are utilizing those facilities. Um, we, did, we did part of that with the walk through the principals, but we did a follow up and some things have tweaked a little bit looking into next year's fall schedule. Um, so we've adapted those, those documents to reflect how do you anticipate the building being used next year. Um, few changes depending on the building. Um, so I won't get in a lot of detail. I know the graphics can support some of the examples that we're doing. We've uh, got very detailed in our observations of the physical deficiencies in the buildings. Um, so we've noted those and that will feed into kind of grading what the conditions are based on the type of uh, component, whether it's carpeting, casework, furniture, um, mechanical electrical systems, we'll be able to give an evaluation of all those different systems and components of the building. Um, and that gives you really a physical background along with solutions and costs. And that's the compilation we're going through right now. That will uh, be accompanied at the point where we have a chance to review it with the operations team uh, to feed that into a long range planning matrix, which will be the kind of the fact book to map out over the next 10 years um, capital improvements. And those are really physical issues within the buildings, but that'll also be a template to talk at a broader level with the community task force in the fall. Um, the, what we see happening going forward is to create that framework for a, that stakeholder engagement or that task force efforts that uh, we anticipate should start in the fall. So in August sometime having the board administration help structure what does that framework look like uh, go through some recruitment of who, who are the folks that would be on that committee. Um, and that's, that's not a, a definitive process, but we've found that to be successful. And what I mapped out in our long range planning diagram is looking at that community group to be broken into three focus groups, one focused on physical conditions, one on educational and functional needs, and one on the community needs. Um, that way people can kind of align with their agendas, but also um, break that group down into some a little bit more manageable uh, subsets and those groups will be charged then with creating criteria for the school district to consider moving forward as far as how do you prioritize the, the needs of the district and they'll each have their focus areas to do so and the goal of that first layer in the fall is to have an agreement or a consensus on what those needs look like and then that at that point we can develop options okay how do we how do we manage this? What does it look like? What's the time frame? Um, ultimately, feeding into your your long range facility master plan, which uh, is still targeted to wrap up uh, by April of next year. We actually envision that being a little quicker than that, but um, we we've been surprised by a few things. So um, we'll, we'll leave that time frame uh, as it stands right now. Any questions for me or for the pro about the process? Dan, would you be willing to share maybe a little bit? You're, you and Mrs. Smith, I know, talked about um, getting focus groups and, and CAC. Can you just talk briefly about what your yeah. thoughts are there? Sure. So um, the CAC group, I know, is anxious to have a, a, a kind of a voice in this process. And uh, we'd anticipate that the that CAC group would have help maybe structure the framework for that community group that uh, we call it facilities task force, but you can name it whatever you want, but that would be a broader group in the fall that would uh, start to gather. And I think the CAC is probably a subset or at least uh, maybe have them the conduit to bring, to recruit that group or possibly even have spokespersons that would align with those three focus groups at the task force level. So maybe a representative from the CAC is aligned with the community voices, the educational voices, and the physical condition voices in that task force. Um, I think that'd be a good way to keep the, the uh, communication going back and forth. Um, also, another layer to talk to the community of where is this process at, uh, the CACIC being also the voice to keep people posted on what's happening. And we wouldn't see uh, from a, I think we want to have these fact books kind of fully fully vetted and baked by the uh, through the summer here before we we certainly don't want that to, anything information to be launched um, that isn't have that kind of vetting process take place. So um, July, June and into July, we see that uh, being that tweaking process. Um, so the fact books are ready for 
publication, so to speak, ready for a broader audience. Um, yeah, does that answer the question, Dr. Chapman? Does that give you a little bit of? Yeah, perfect, thank you. I think there's, there's probably more development of that interface with the CAC yet to come, but that's kind of the big picture I think, version. I think we've looked at having you come in and do a presentation in August. I think I have that right. Um, so if, if that still can work out, that will help. Um, we'll need to have a conversation as to um, what the board is looking for in terms of the community and how CAC might, um, as you said, be a conduit or um, part of that post, the task force. So we are anticipating to use the CAC as much as we can. Yeah, that makes sense. And the timing is will work perfect. Great. What were the three categories that you talked about um, having the task force be in? Well, so the, um, and this is just a model we've seen success with is to break down the, the, the size of the group at a community, at a task force level is uh, a community group, which would be looking at how do uh, the facilities support the community? Um, what things are the community, what would they like to see um, as the, the facilities allow them to do and support things outside of maybe the school they the, the other is uh, educational environments which is usually educator heavy but that doesn't have to be um, but that's just uh, how are the buildings supporting curriculum and delivery and uh, you know how how do they become more future ready looking in, down the line and then the third is the physical conditions of the building and a lot of that is somewhat already givens but uh, the, the information we're creating right now will be the platform for them to start talking about um, whether it's energy efficiency or um, envelope, but the issues that uh, need to be prioritized for keeping up facilities. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Not seeing any, but um, thank you um, for coming in virtually. Uh, we'll speak. <laughs> I know we we're we've been excited to, to see your progress. Um, so it was a good first glimpse, and I think everyone on the board is excited to continue to see the progress that's made and um, kind of unpack that at future dates. So great. So thank, thank you. For, Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, giving us update tonight. All right. Thanks. And if there's nothing else, Dr. Chevin, do you have anything else to add on that? No, nope, just appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Okay. All right. And then that will lead us into item P, which is the Haynes construction update. Yeah, it's uh, presentations kind of in your packet so you can see some pictures of progress. We're right at the goal line right now, finishing up. Um, if we get some dry weather, we'd finish up that exterior and rip that fence down and everybody be able to see how beautiful that facade looks uh, off the off the Oak and 9th Street looks just beautiful but uh, they're wrapping up with the transition spaces um, planning on a move in in the middle of June and uh, doing punch list items from there on so uh, again a very a very strong project at the June committee I will go over in more detail the financial summary um, certainly that's in in your packet as well you'll see that blown through the contingency uh, pretty easily. There's been some unexpected things like moisture mitigation that we've had to deal with, um, but I do still anticipate being very close to on budget. Um, our last change order, which will be change order number five that'll be issued in June, will have a credit back to us uh, of over $50,000. So that'll help actually, you look at the contingency, you always expect that to go up. It'll actually go down uh, the next month you see that. So um, again, we've enjoyed a really good relationship with with SRAM. They've done uh, nice work and we're, we're excited to get in the space uh, next month. Um, Dr. Chapman, um, do you know when the, I know it depends on what phase we're in for COVID-19, when the library is gonna be able to open up? Rose. Uh, the library is ready to open up whenever we're allowed to be, be open. So 
So it's just yeah. it's just the governor's mm -hmm. phasing in. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. it's ready, ready to go. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in, Dr. Chapman, but no, you're, you you're look delayed, so I don't know if you were frozen or not sure what to say. But yeah, the library is ready, um, uh, Mrs. McCabe. So it just depends on uh, yeah what our our limitations are in regards to a COVID. So great. Um, I and for that I would just you know we can um, keep people abreast, but also you know just keep your ear to the ground with the state. Thanks. Yeah, for both the library and the park district, their websites so will we'll continue to keep that information updated. So if anybody in the community asks, it's always the best place to go. Any other questions on Haynes? Okay. I just realized I was still on mute, so I apologize. <laughs> um, all right. Well, then that takes us to our future agenda items, um, which will be on June 29th, uh, business service meeting dates, our annual approve existing safety hazards for the school year, GSF renewal, some policy updates, and uh, continued Haynes construction updates. Anything else, Dr. Chairman? No, that's great. And just please, if you've got questions on the budget coming out of tonight, uh, feel free to just reach out to me and we will certainly address those. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks. I know it's, um, you did a great job trying to get the presentation put together without being able to do it in person. So uh, thank you for your hard work and your staff's hard work on that. Mr. Manhattan, I just have one, oh, sorry. One quick final comment for you and Dr. Chapman. Just if you guys could, I know it's difficult because we don't know gonna um, kind of where we're at schedule wise, keep us updated on when Wold will be back to, you know, give us updates because I know we'll have them in the future, but I don't know if the board knows exactly what that means. So um, maybe we can get a presentation timeline at some point as to when they're gonna be back. I don't know about in person or virtual person. Um, I know they're gonna talk to CAC and then when would that come back to us and that, that kind of back and forth as they meet with their groups as to when it's gonna be reported or how it's gonna be reported back to the board. Does that sound good? Yeah, and I think it'll probably, um, as we start to unpack information, it'll probably filter down to several committees, you know, CIC, uh, business services, learning and teaching, you know, as we as we okay. discuss different portions of their findings and everything. I think we just want to make sure it filters back and is reported to the full board because some of those committees aren't full board. Yeah, that's, yeah, we'll do that. Okay. Cool, thanks. All right, anything else? Then I will adjourn business services at 6.59 p.m.